We have our program this evening by uh, Harold Ryder. Um, a little bit about Harold. Uh, Harold uh, is a graduate or uh, attended uh, Bowling Green University uh, and YSU and a graduate from the Real Estate Management of Chicago. He was born and raised in Warren, Ohio. Uh, then he retired in 1998. Uh, as the president of the Wedgwood uh, Property Management Group uh, and then spent uh, after that the next 10 years uh, cons doing consulting work with uh, condo associations and the real estate developers uh, and then in 2010 he got involved in the USS uh, Oklahoma and has been uh, heavily involved ever since so I wanted to introduce Harold Ryder at this point to uh, give us his program on the Christmas letter and his uh, research on the USS Oklahoma. First, is this okay? Everybody hear me? No? no. Louder or closer? Is it on? It's fine. It's, yeah. it's, it's okay. It's okay? Yeah. yeah. Is that better? All right. I want to thank you for having us here this evening. Um, when you see the presentation, you're going to understand that our mission is to raise public awareness of the what we call the forgotten battleship of World War II, the USS Oklahoma. This slide shows the ships on December 7th 1941. Howdy. Take the microphone. Oh, yeah. How about this one? Turn it on. Headlights. Better. This one better? Turn it on, though. Turn it on. And wait by 10 seconds. No. How's that now? There you go. Oh, there you go. All right. This is the configuration of the, the Navy base at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. That is the USS Oklahoma. That is the Maryland, Tennessee, West Virginia, Nevada. I'm sorry, that's Vestal. That's Nevada and that's the Arizona. The Oklahoma was in line as the first attack came in from this direction. It was really the only ship they couldn't miss. On the history of the Oklahoma, construction in uh, started in 2000, or 1912, launched in 14, and uh, went into service in 16, almost at the end of uh, World War I. The Oklahoma was the first oil-fired oil -fired battleship. World War I, she was limited to a mundane existence for the next 20 years. The ship was used for escorts. Um, it escorted President uh, Wilson to the talks after World War I to Europe. The Oklahoma was one of eight battleships. What did we lose here? Where's my IT person? <laughs> you have me now. <laughs> Okay. The Oklahoma is one of eight battleships in the U.S. Pacific Fleet. All the battleships of the fleet were in port at the same time. This had not taken place in Navy history before, and all battleships, all ships of any fleet, have not been in port at the same time since. When we recover, you will see a slide of the 
statistics of the Pearl Harbor battle. There was Two thousand four hundred and three casualties on that day. I think we saw this once before, and we just did a um, went out and came back in, recovered it that way. I've got the mouse here. If Let me just try this. With your mouse, try reload file, because it won't there. let me do it. Let me try this. November 12th. It's the second one. Second one at the top. There yep. you go. Right there. I could, should be able to do it if it lets me. Double, double click from current slide. There we go. Okay. There we are. Of the 2,403 casualties, over 1,600 of those were sailors, Navy. The Arizona lost 1177 and the Oklahoma lost 429. Through this presentation you'll find that the uh, Oklahoma, some of these comments and facts and figures, you have heard of the Arizona at Pearl Harbor and that's why we call this the Forgotten Battleship. Other than the Arizona, the Oklahoma suffered more casualties at Pearl Harbor than any other group. This is the results of the first raid. As you can see where the Air Oklahoma was docked. It has now been hit by torpedoes. It has capsized. It has entombed 388 of the 429 that were killed in that first raid. The Arizona is parked right about there and it has not yet been bombed. The Oklahoma capsized within 9 to 11 minutes after the first torpedo hit it. It took somewhere between 9 and 12 torpedoes. The entire side of the ship was blown out. They couldn't count the holes. It instantly capsized in tombing these sailors, of which 14 are Marines. That's how the ship looked a year and a half later. There are still 388 bodies in that ship. In the spring of 1943, after a year of planning, they attempted and started to raise the Oklahoma. This picture shows how they did it. They welded these towers to the hull, attached them to concrete anchors on shore and winched them. There's 24 of those. They winched those 
literally inch by inch, one after another, because they couldn't do them all at once, and you had to do them a little bit at a time. It took months before that was accomplished. After it was in this position, the same cables were used, but they were attached to the side of the ship to pull it over where it was upright. At this time, the bodies were removed. They weren't bodies. They weren't skeletons. They were just mostly pieces, parts, and bones. This is an internal government memo dated May 28, 2013, recommending a course of action three which says, memorialize and close the case. This memo was a result of some Oklahoma sailors who survived and were wondering about their shipmates who were lost and petitioned Congress in 2000 to do something about it. In 2010, the Navy contracted with a forensic genealogist to locate the families of these 388. That notification came by telephone from a civilian who was working on the genealogy, and it was the first notification that these families had since the end of World War II that these bodies even existed. Course of Action 3 wanted to just leave them where they were in these, un or these mass graves and, but they dropped their objection. That was signed by the Secretary of the Navy and the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Those objections were dropped in late 2013. One of those sailors is Stanislaw Dural, pattern maker first class. And what this story is about. I want to tell you about a family and there's this story or a version of it would have happened 380 some times all over the country <clears throat> because it was Christmas 1941 and I call this story the Christmas letter and it's about the family of Stanley DeWall. On Thursday, December 4th, 1941, Stanley is writing a letter home to his parents. This is where pattern maker first class Stanley DeWall mailed this letter to his family. Several weeks later, included in this letter that he sent to his family in West Virginia was a money order and a personal message. He took the letter to the ship's post office and mailed. All capital ships at that time had their own post office. I want you to picture in your mind a typical company house in a small coal mining town of Douglas, West Virginia. Total population 900. A few weeks later, this 
little girl that we're talking about was sitting at the kitchen table with her grandmother. It was a happy time for this little girl. Christmas was coming. Her grandmother was reading the letter from her Uncle Stanley. <coughs> the last paragraph of the letter reads, I'm sending this money order to buy presents for everyone that is home. And don't forget Mary Ann. Tell her that it came from Uncle Santa. <clears throat> A week or so later, this little girl was again sitting at the kitchen table with her grandmother. There was a knock on the door. It was their neighbor. They knew him very well. Came to visit often. He was the Western Union guy for this little town. He was in his Western Union uniform. He was there to deliver a telegram. The little girl watched as her grandmother opened the telegram and began to cry. At that time, this little girl didn't understand why her grandmother was crying. But she remembers it as if it was yesterday. The telegram reads, the Navy Department deeply regrets to inform you that your son, Stanislaw Frank Derwal, pattern maker, first class, is missing following the action in the performance of his duty while in the service of his country. The department appreciates your great anxiety and will furnish you with further information when received. To prevent possible aid to our enemies, please do not divulge the name of his ship or station. Signed, Rear Admiral Rudolph. On Valentine's Day, February 14, 1942, again the little girl was with her grandmother. This official telegraph arrives. It reads, after exhaustive search, it has been found impossible to locate your son, Stanislaw Frank Derwal, pattern maker, first class, U.S. Navy. And <clears throat> he has therefore been officially declared to have lost his life in the service of his country as of December 7th, 1941. The department expresses to you its sincere sympathy. Signed, Rear Admiral, Rear Admiral Randall Jacobs. Her grandmother then told this little girl that her Uncle Stanley would not be coming home. It was some 50 years later that the government acknowledged they had removed the remains from the Oklahoma when it was raised in 1943. These servicemen had been buried in unmarked mass graves. Only 48 coffins, correction, 48 grave sites. These 48 grave sites contained 61 coffins. And 
in those 61 coffins were the remains of 388 bodies, including 14 Marines. These grave markers were not put on that grave until 2002. That grave is in the National Cemetery of the Pacific, known as the Punch Bowl. The Punch Bowl what didn't exist in 1943. The remains of the Oklahoma MIAs were distributed and buried in private cemeteries, city cemeteries all over Hawaii. The Navy lost the records and didn't find them until the early 1950s. At that time, the Cemetery of the Pacific did exist. And they were removed from the sites all over Hawaii and reburied in the punch bowl. But the markers didn't go on until 2002. In 2002, the families didn't know they existed. Seventy-eight years later, right now, this is the cemetery in Thomas, Tucker County, West Virginia. That's the headstone for Stanley Grewal. This grave is empty. In 2015, the government exhumed these co-mingled graves and began DNA testing to identify these servicemen and send the remains home to their families for proper burial, closure, and to have a full military funeral. As of today, 225 had now been identified. More than 165 are still listed as MIAs. The last chapter of this story hasn't yet been written. This little girl is still waiting for her Uncle Stanley to come home. Just come home for one more Christmas. Back to the history of the Oklahoma. That ship is the length of two football fields. Weighs 30,000 tons. The newer battleships, later built in World War II, were three football fields long and just about as wide. Our mission, this public awareness program, depends on groups like this to allow us to tell the story of the forgotten battleship of World War II. Your support and donations keep us going and the greatest support you can do is tell as many people as you know about the Oklahoma. That helps us fulfill our mission. There was one more slide. It's this comment. Our government's job is to do the DNA testing. To do the forensic genealogy to bring home the MIA sailors and Marines killed at Pearl Harbor. Our mission is to make sure they do their job. And we need help to do our job. 
And one last thing in conclusion. I'd like you now to meet that little girl. My wife, Mary Ann. Um, also, the program will be available on our website, so although we didn't have too many people here this evening, uh, anyone in the community or the public will be able to view that at Salem Historical Society um, and also at the Western Reserve um, te public, um, community television channel. So, um, Thank you. That's good for us because we can put it on our website and they can come. We can. We'll give you the link as soon as it's posted. So. Wonderful. Um, yes. Carol Jill has a question. In Pearl Harbor, back of the Oklahoma, now what what year was she put afloat again? Did you say it was in 1947? No. no. In 19, at the end of uh, 1943. Okay. Once they had all the bodies removed, it was uh, temporarily patched to move it across the harbor to dry dock. It was determined in about November of 43 that this ship cannot be repaired. It was towed to the backwaters um, and parked next to the Utah. Now some historians claim the Utah was the third battleship lost to Pearl Harbor. But the Utah had been decommissioned in 1935, and it was there only as a uh, practice uh, gunship. So um, it was not officially a battleship. So the only two lost in the war were the Arizona and the Oklahoma. There was never a battleship sunk in the rest of World War II. It was sold for scrap in 1947, ironically for $47,000. And it was under tow back to the west coast and about 700 miles out the tugs lost it in a storm and they all it almost took the tugs down with it but they got the cables cut in time and it's sitting at the 700 miles between the west coast and uh, hawaii it has been found it has been photographed and it looks like somebody had taken the ship and set it on a white sand flat bottom sitting upright just like it was parked there. Maybe I over answered your question. Oh no, I was fine. You mentioned during, uh, the, again, uh, when she had been commissioned the First World War, she was oil fired. Yes. Because my uncle Vic, he was on the New York, and that, he, that was all still coal, because he had to work down the boiler room. But the New York was a cruiser, mm -hmm. not a battleship. And um, they converted all of the other battleships to oil. And by 1941, all the battleships were oil fired. And a ironic piece of history if anybody is interested I have some documents here I asked some people here is there anybody really a Pearl Harbor buff we have a letter from her uncle Stanley describing a collision between the Arizona and the Oklahoma in October 1941 causing severe damage to the Arizona, requiring it to go into dry dock for repairs. And in there so long, it missed its orders to go to San Francisco in early December. Our research has finally found declassified documents to prove that. And I have copies with me if anybody would like to look at them. <clears throat> we have testimonials from three separate Pearl Harbor survivors. 
who were on the ship, who were at Pearl Harbor, saying that the Arizona should never have been in Pearl Harbor on December 7th. And this is a piece of history that we have, since we got involved with the Department of Defense, we've asked them for these records. They never heard of the story, for one thing. Their historians have never heard of the story. And we finally found a group in Atlanta who would help us to dig through the National Archives and find the collision reports. So it, it's uh, an offshoot of our research and everything about the Oklahoma and Pearl Harbor that we came up with this. But in a letter that her uncle had sent to his, her, his mother in October describes the collision. Is this also the ship that actually capsized over that there were sailors were knocking on her hull to let them know that they were there were yes. still men in there? Yes. And how many how many days did those men knock on this on the hull? Five days. Five days. The first photograph you show of the of the Oklahoma being capsized, was it taken by US aircraft or by was that by Japanese those aircraft? Those were uh, films from the Japanese. Japanese that's what I thought. Yeah. It's a, um, we just want to tell the story. We just want to let people know. We want you to, uh, to run into your congressman or anybody. Ask them about the Oklahoma. They don't know about it. Hmm. I mean, we've met with them and we've told them about it. And, um, Two weeks ago, our congressman, I'm from Northern Trumbull County, so it's uh, David Joyce, had a nice conversation with his staffer, who we have corresponded with over the last five years or so. And I hate to say it, when I asked Congressman Joyce about the Oklahoma, he sort of didn't know what I was talking about. And the other congressman to the south, um, Tim Ryan was on the Armed Services Committee for many years and um, we've attempted to correspond with all of the congressmen and senators in the local area and we never heard a word from them yet to this day. Those trapped sailors, weren't they able to remove some of them? That oh, yes. were knocking in the, on the hull? Yeah, it was 429 killed. Yeah. There's still 388 that were lost in the show. But they, but they were able to get yes. a few of them out. Yes. Yes. Some, yeah. of, some of them, uh, when the ship went over, were able to get out to port. Is that correct? Yes. So they weren't all trapped. But um, not too many of them. I find it very interesting that that's going to be available on tape. It is. That's a big plus. Um, well, those of you who are veterans, if you could please join us for a photograph, stay for refreshments and conversation with Harold, Marianne, and um, any of the other members. And thank you for braving the cold. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having us.